Hello, everyone. So I thought I'd start with a very quick summary of the film, but more about the context. The, uh, although the film's name is Char or Modhika ne Char, which means literally in between the islands, uh, it's not really a proper name. It's the word Char really refers to sand em um, embankments and silt islands. Here, the film's focus is on the silt islands or chores in the middle of the Ganga River, along a stretch where the river coincides with the international border between Bangladesh and India. In the 60s, when Bangladesh was still East Pakistan, Farakka Barrage, this big dam or barrage, was commissioned by the Indian government without much comprehensive study of its ecological effects. And then the Bangladesh war happened in 1971 and the barrage becomes operational in 1975. Since then, there have been many international disputes over the water distribution of the river because as the upper river uh, partner in this two uh, nation uh, encounter, India has the control with this barrage over the water flow into the uh, lower level, you know, the lower part of the river in Bangladesh. So what's really been kind of critical are the riverbank erosions because the river is quite broad here and quite powerful. So it's been dammed up and that produces all kinds of torques. So on both sides, Bangladesh and India, there have been extensive riverbank erosions and then silt and debris form these islands in the middle of the river. So that's where Shourav Sarangi takes us with this film. So Shourav, I wanted to just start with, how did you come to make this film? What kind of, uh, you know, interest that led you to this particular terrain? What were your entry points? Thank you, Vashkar, and thank you, the Soap Center, for having me here. And uh, thank you for all those who are participating. And coming to your question, uh, uh, Bhaskar, uh, it happened, I would call it by just by chance, because a journalist friend of mine, he was uh, uh, making a short television story on river erosion in the border district from Indian side at Murshidabad. And I just hopped into his car. And, and when we reached the location, I literally went numb because the river was eroding. Uh, and I never saw something like that before. I saw houses after houses, small huts. They were going down to the river, like it was put into a water grave. Big trees, they were just slowly falling into the river. Roads were just cracking. And the, 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 the place where we landed, the cracks started, you know, appearing just in front of me. So. Uh, uh, it was like, uh, and people were running helter skelter. A few kids went missing, and the mother didn't know whether to, you know, protect the house or look for the kids. It was a kind of a slow motion apocalypse for me. It was nothing like an earthquake or fire. It was happening very slowly, and that affected me. And when I came back. And those images uh, uh, remained with me. And I sometimes I couldn't sleep at night and the, the, those came back. That's when I think things started happening uh, and I had to go back, not for any television news, for, 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 for myself to see what happens after that, what happens to these people. And as you correctly mentioned, uh, things started, uh, uh, you know, it was like uh, peeling an onion, the Faraka barrage, like a monster which stood on the river. Uh, and uh, of course, more things like it's a border, it's an international border which is set at the midpoint of the river, a river which moves. And it's a, as you said, it's a, it's a, it's a vast meandering river. And then I witnessed the displacements, the migration the loss of identities. And my question was, what is next? Where after losing ho your home, after losing your land, where you make your cultivation, where your survival basically depends on, if you lose that, uh, what happens to you next? 
So they gave me the answer uh, in Chor, which um, you know uh, is is the film all about, and it's a long journey for me, I would say. What was the Ricky for this film like? I mean, you mentioned that you went to with another project as a head of a TV station, right? And so what was it like and how did you spend your time? How long did you spend time in the area before you actually started shooting? Uh, and what, what was the length of the shooting? I imagine it's for many years, right? Well, uh, if, I, if I calculate that way, my, uh, my, my visits to the location and not shooting all the time, you know, sometimes it was just being there to see what's happening. And uh, uh, until the uh, time I completely, uh, 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 you know, uh, completely stopped shooting and st uh, stopped editing too. Uh, uh, I said, no, this is the time. I'm not going to touch the computer again. It may be 10 years. Wow. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long time. Yes, uh, Bhaskar, uh, I, I, I uh, you know, changed my professional position in that period. I, I was working in a television station at the same time. I was uh, you know, writing and making other films. Uh, uh, one is Bilal, which you have seen, and many, uh, some of my friends who are, might be, have seen here. So I kept in touch and I made a kind of, first I made a film on the, the, the reason why this erosion takes place. It's a, it's, a, it's a journalistic film. And what happens to the people who lose their homes? What do they do? What happens with the polity, uh, the, the, the government agencies? And, and how people find their lost rights because when you lose your address, when you lose your home, home, you lose your identity because the identity comes through like something like a voter card. People do not have passports here. No, they don't need passports to cross the border. In fact, um, it's, it's, it's easy. You just cross it. So uh, 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 when you lose your ration card, or when you lose your voter card, you lose your identity. You know? And that happens when you don't have an address. So uh, I made a film about that. It's called Erosion or Vangon, which was extensively used by the local people. It was, of course, it was shown um, in festivals and uh, never broadcast though. But the, the film was uh, oriented to show it locally for the people and they screened the film. I gave the copyrights of the film to the local people. Mm -hmm. And they screened it, they sold CDs. And since nothing was happening, no politician, every politician said that come the next election, vote for me and I'll do everything for you. You know, the government officials said, make an application. When the scheme, the government of India or government of West Bengal makes a scheme, we'll let you know. But nothing happened. So you'll be very happy that with, by selling the rights of the film, at least some people got rehabilitated. So that was a kind of a film. And I would say the erosion part of the film, which you see in Chor, I did not uh, take any archive footage from any other TV station or any other place. It was the footage that I shot, shot shooting Chor, uh, shooting erosion or Vangon. Uh, and when I shoot a uh, short, uh, um, say, chore in the island, which is found much later in course of this, uh, you know, my 10 years I mentioned, mm -hmm. the people who were waiting for the chore to reappear in the middle of the river mm -hmm. because it's their land. The land doesn't move. It's only the river that moves. They pay tax for the land. So when the land appeared within the river, so they shipped it there and I, uh, they asked me, now we are shifting so you can come and see our new homes. So I was there. I had to kind of smuggle myself. I was not welcomed by the border police, of course. And that's how my new journey began. And I shot in Chor in that island uh, for one year. 
almost continuously uh, 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 by staying there. And but uh, you know, Vasco, something funny happened because I wanted to show the rise of the level of water, which is uh, what that dictates the life, uh, the level of water. Everything goes by that. And there was no rain that year. There, it, there was a drought, and it rained in Pakistan. And there was a flood in Pakistan. So I had to wait for a longer time to shoot the monsoon, where uh, and uh, shoot almost one more year to shoot only the water next year. So, yeah. So you had to smuggle yourself, you say. I can imagine only then the kind of difficulties then the challenges you might have had to deal with. So if you give us a few examples of that. Um, yeah, examples uh, like, yeah, of course, smuggle myself, meaning uh, nobody is welcome there uh, uh, because mm. it's an international border. It's right. not a heavily militarized border like Kashmir in uh, with Pakistan or in parts of uh, Punjab. Uh, it's it's a, a Bangladesh is a uh, more you know I would say uh, you know India and Bangladesh are in more friendly terms, and uh, um, but still it's an international border and the border police do not want outsiders, especially mm -hmm. someone with a camera, to mm -hmm. to be there, and. Uh, uh, so uh, the getting the permission, official permission, was re really a tough one, and Bhaskar, But uh, uh, it took a long time and a lot of efforts. Mm -hmm. And but getting the trust of the local people, because uh, that was, I suppose, the most challenging part of it. And because I was not an outsider to them, because I was spending a lot of time with them and staying with them, yeah, so it was easy, but there was an ethical question whether you can shoot the people you know and you, according to the government or the legal patterns, uh, can you really show them smuggling stuff? So I had to sort this question to mm -hmm. myself and them. And of course, there are uh, 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 challenges like when you go to uh, Chor, there is no electricity. It's cut off from the mainland. It's a, just a sandy patch of a uh, piece of land within the river surrounded by all sides and nothing is there. No, there is no road, no electricity, no school, no nothing. So how do you charge your batteries? You need that. So we had a kind of battery unit which used to go to the mainland India by crossing the river and the border check was for the batteries. So uh, things like that, you know, and and uh, living there in Chor was not easy. And I had to, uh, some of my crews kept changing uh, they, because they could not survive because there are city people like you and me who could not survive there for long. Somehow I adapted and stayed there. And sometimes you, uh, while shooting, I remember, I must tell you this, that one day we, we strayed into Bangladesh, because do, you don't have the border like a fence here. It's it's like the, it was the river, and then this land came up, and what they did is they put up some pillars, and these pillars are let's say 200 meters uh, interval. So there virtually exists nothing, and we had a border police from Indian side, which is called BSF, Border Security Force, who were accompanying us. And I think he was new and he came from North India, speaking Hindi, not the language that we speak in that area. And somehow uh, we uh, got into Bangladesh border and he was there with us and the Bangladesh BDR, Bangladeshi rifles, somehow they spotted us with the binoculars, I suppose. And they saw us moving very suspiciously with, you know, tripods and cameras and body uh, you know, stabilizers and boom rods. Th those could be, you know, anything like you no know, weapon. So they came and accosted us, and we were caught on the wrong side. And our border police, BSF guy, he really panicked and he did not understand the language, which I did, or the Bangladeshi, because the Bangladeshi uh, police and me, both being Bengalis. It's a partition between the same language province. 
uh, we uh, and the Hindi speaking border security force, he really asked us to lie down and take position and anything could happen, no bullets could fly. So I said, hey man, what are you doing? We just straight into, we made a mistake. We should tell them that we are mistaken. We are here not to, you know, that for that. So uh, anyways, uh, we were caught and because I became kind of the negotiator between two border police people, <laughs> the Indian side and the Bangladeshi side to be rescued back to India. And things could happen like that. Of course, there were mafias. Yeah, and, local mafia. And, local mafias and the, in the film i don't uh, put uh, this uh, issue because in the film everything i did not put but there were local mafias with very strong weapons you know the the, the socket bombs and the you know the missiles that they could put and you could hear the sounds they could dance with swords at night to frighten you because we are not really welcome to shoot what is going on there not only the border police they did not want us it is also the mafias who did not want us. So, so all sorts of things. Just to get into that a little bit more, uh, the local mafias kind of organize these displaced people into labor forms, right? So, you know, for instance, when I think about uh, what has been written about various borders, US, Mexico, but also the Mediterranean, this scholar called Nicolas de Genova talks about the scandal of the borders being how permeable they actually are. So for all their pretensions to stop the flow of people, they actually allow people to enter because then they become available for all kinds of intensive exploitation, right? So you are talking about this particular aspect here too, right? Like, because they would be, for instance, given promises of a voter card and perhaps a citizenship card, and then they'll be made to vote fraudulently or smuggle rice and other stuff yes of course uh, I can, you, you every border is different but the basic character is the same i think the border is an abstract construct which we try to make real by the state mm -hmm. and the state authorities so uh, it does actually it doesn't exist but we make it look like yeah it exists and, and uh, the real realities across all borders are the same, I suppose. And the people who live in the borders, in the fringes, uh, they, they, they have to be used to be the system of uh, denominations on both the sides. It's an artificial side. So the authorities, both the, the, uh, they will utilize it. And at the same time, the traders, and you can call them mafias, the, the businessmen, uh, they have to have a different tactics to deal with that. To, to yes, the local people who are uh, uh, who especially who become powerless, who become homeless, they fall prey to that. And not only uh, it is the rice and uh, uh, you know small stuff, it can be um, it can be very um, it can be gold, it can be weapons and. Uh, it can be human trafficking, human trafficking that takes place, uh, which is very special to India-Bangladesh border and also India-Nepal border. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it happens very frequently. And um, there are, of course, the, 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 the cocaine and other stuff uh, that happens. Yes, the local people, when they become powerless, you can see the whole community losing their job because they don't have the land. They are farmers, essentially. They're river people and they, they are fishermen. So if you stop them to go to the river to fish, because that is the border, what do you expect them to do? So they become victims of the prey of the local mafias, of course. And this is a huge network. It's a very powerful network and which uh, uh, you saw in the film that the BSF put a you know a notice the border security they, force yeah border security force because they do not take any bribe so they have to say it <laughs> with a poster so yes so it's it's a whole network which operates and sometimes things go wrong and that's when you hear it becomes a news so uh, 
you know, in this film, you strike primarily a very contemplative ro you know, tone because there are all these incredibly beautiful long takes of, you know, in the foreground, a crack appears and then slowly, very slowly, the riverbank cascades, kind of breaks apart very slowly and then quickly cascades into the water. While right behind, a few meters away, fishermen are completely oblivious. They're just throwing their net around and doing their stuff, right? I, it, that scene really stayed with me. Or you mentioned the date palm, like slowly going into the river. Or there are moments like, uh, you know, the, the local Muslim uh, community praying and stuff happening around. And yet somehow, in spite of this contemplative tone, you managed to convey not quite the interventionist activism of many a documentary film, but something like a slow burn agency. And I was, you know, it makes me always think about uh, recent work where people talk about, uh, Rob Nixon particularly, moves away from this idea of a crisis or a catastrophe and talking more about sort of the slow violence over a long period of time that have produced the current moment of crisis. And we can just think about crisis, crisis scenarios, but really to think about the long-term things going on. And I think the film is really successful in kind of pointing a finger towards these slow processes. Uh, so how did you kind of try to think about a balance very short you know briefly if you can yeah yeah, yeah. thank you Vasco, for noticing this yes this was a very conscious uh, thing because i was not going to make a journalistic television reportage for this film because a lot of people are doing that what i did is what happens after the calamity happened takes place you know i was pensive i was waiting for the next and if you look at the local, uh, because I was trying to, uh, you know, in, uh, experience the, the, the local rhythm, mm -hmm. lifestyle, li rhythm of the local people. When you lose your home, you go to the politician for help, he refuses. You go to the you know, government official, I said, after that, nothing happens. What, what do you do? I saw a lot of people just sitting by the river bank and doing nothing. I could feel that there is a communication with the river and these people because these are river people. Mm -hmm. It may be a non-verbal communication. He, talk, he goes into the past, he lives in the present mm -hmm. and he thinks of the future just by sitting there. You know, so, so I was trying to understand what this man is actually thinking. And so, so uh, I would say that, uh, yes, uh, you could say that there is a, a kind of precarious position that he is sitting in because it might not be there. The terra farmer is, will be gone next uh, flood or next uh, phase of erosion, but he is not really panicked. He is and what you see, the mention, it struck me because it shows also the resilience of the people. Mm -hmm. And when we have a change, even in terms of if you have a climate change, it is absolutely essential that we have the climate resilience to, to face the new situation. And these people, I respect for them. And I did not want to have this sense of pity from, for them, from my audience, because they, they should be respected because they have their human dignity they never came and begged for help they right. tried to you know uh, be, be self-sufficient they knew that this is, it is this is their land this is their homeland this is their country and with they can defend it without any border police which they have been doing for ages yeah so so i i felt the dignity of these people and their resilience and i wanted to bring that spirit uh, in, in the style, somehow I had to do it in the stylistics of the film, in the narratology of the film, which cannot be a helter skelter run and gun situation. It's much more profound. It's much more, you know, uh, I would say spiritual, which comes from uh, living with nature in complete unison for ages, for generations, 
which I tried to bring in the film. Uh, maybe that made the difference from the other approaches, which could be an activist uh, you know, film. No, it's, uh, I took a different stance to it as well. Yeah. So just to bring up, you know, in terms of what these people in this area have experienced. So, pe you know, border scholars have talked about how the border line is sort of this Apollonian cartographic gesture. And in 1947, pretty much overnight, Radcliffe draws the line and partitions Bengal during the partition of the subcontinent into India and Pakistan. And literally people have talked about this extensively, how in some situations, the line literally goes across people's courtyards, like living quarters, so that the kitchen is on one side and the living quarters on the other, or one cousin is one side on the other. So really we have more recent years learn to think about the border not as that kind of clear line of demarcation but as a thicket not so much the border a thicket of activities really right not so much the border line but the border as a zone border lands so william van shendel or paula Banerjee or ranubi shamadar have written about it and i keep thinking of shamadar's uh, wonderful work where he's talking to a BSF uh, guy who's bemoaning the fact that they don't get any help from local people in stopping the infiltrators from coming in. The point is, why would they, right? Because these people have to depend on each other on both sides of the border. That's their community. It just so happens that there's a border in between them. So, you know, that I was thinking of. And then, you know, the other thing I wanted to bring up here is a lot also has been written about the security aesthetic that sort of emerges in all these border zones, like kind of militarized zone of surveillance and check posts and barbed wires and these huge lights, searchlights going in the night sky, right? And you have shown us that. And in doing that, you have used the infrared technology, the cinematography, which provides this uh, sense of kind of a night vision uh, surveillance in a militarized war zone. And this is kind of like a war zone in many ways, people do get shot, but at the same time, often using exactly the same technique, you have shown us what I have called a aesthetic of precarity of the people. So one incredible sequence that I can think of is this storm comes. And this is a situation we have to remember. These islands are so precarious that they could disappear in the next flood or the very next cyclone. And this is a very cyclone prone area, right? And you have this incredible shot of a hut on one of these chores. And then there's lightning across the sky in this eerie greenish light that the infrared technology allows you to kind of achieve. Uh, so I, I really wanted to bring that up because the same kind of strategy helps you show us the aesthetic of security, but also makes us hyper aware of this precarity of these people. Okay, Bhaskar, that's a broad issue. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but did you know that Radcliffe didn't have a map when he drew the line? Yeah. He had some documents of tax correct office. So the line he drew had no match with the reality. So it was, uh, and he had a very long, uh, short time. And it became almost imperative after World War II that the British had to leave this subcontinent. Mm -hmm. So. Um, but they were just preparing, so they were just relegating the powers to others, and we took the decision to split the country on the basis of religion, yeah. and that that uh, that created havoc. And uh, you know, uh, like you mentioned, that the the border passed through the court here. I have visited some houses in Nodia district, like you know, I saw the iron uh, pillar within the court here. Uh, yes, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a really uh, uh, a zone. It's a very strange zone. 
because I think there is a there are two concepts, Marco, as I see it. You know, one is a concept of a homeland, mm -hmm. which is my country, where I live, which is human, where I have my house, where I invite people from outside to come at my home, my neighbors. And mm -hmm. there is another concept of a benevolent nation state, I would say, which is based maybe on a language, which may be a theocracy, which may be a political system. And we have a different construct for that. We are concerned about the territorial sovereignty, I would say. And we make a system and we make the borders look invincible. You know, so we make a surveillance system and what you call a very nice term, aesthetics of surveillance, I do not know what where the aesthetics really it looks, yeah, it, it looks very convincing. But if you look at the loopholes, because uh, there is, uh, you create a border within the midpoint of a river, and now this river is a very large one, and it's a meandering river, and it's a moving river, especially after you create something, a barrage, a large dam in Faraka, which makes the river, uh, the river never understood the purpose of this part. So the river uh, started reacting in a very odd way that we did not expect her to do. So it changed its course. And you create a border on the middle of the river. So being there, Vaskar, if, I, if you are given the responsibility to look into the international border between two countries on the moving river, on the midpoint, what would you do? You know, so you take all kinds of, you know, facade, you know, the light, uh, the search lights, the, the border check post. And imagine one situation, Marshka, that uh, you have your house on the mainland and the river was there far. And the river comes and takes your home. And the new land is from within the river and you shipped because you kept the bricks and the wooden uh, fences and, uh, uh, you know, windows to ship there, you took, take that there on your you know, head, you carry it and, but the, where do the border police go? Yeah. So the previously, they have to also ship. So previously when you came home from the marketplace, you just straight came home. But now if you have to come for the marketplace, which is in India now, mainland, and you have to cross the border point and show your identity to go get back to your home every day, every time. So it's an absurdity. So the sense of homeland becomes dissociated from our existence. So the country where I belong to no longer remains my homeland. It's a war zone, as you said. It doesn't belong to me. A border, extremely, it can be cruel, violent, and can be humiliating. People yeah. get humiliated by to live there. On a daily and basis. On a, on a daily basis. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's a dehumanizing process for them. Right. So, which, which, which I had to notice. And regarding the, uh, the, the, uh, the precarity, uh, the aesthetics of uh, precarity, as you say, yes, life is like that then. And the aesthetics, I think, is normal. The the shot you mentioned actually, is, you know, uh, I, I was staying with them. There is no hotel to stay in Chop. Mm -hmm. So the house, uh, the hut you mean is actually the hut I was living in, mm -hmm. and it was blowing. You feel crazy. You don't know what is gonna happen. But somehow I had to shoot, and I took my camera and took it out. And regarding use of that kind of lighting which, which you, you, that you see in the BSF uh, police also using is because there is no light. There is no artificial light over there. And when I created the artificial light, the LED lights from outside and I put it up while shooting in the night, there were crowds because you bring light to a place when there is an event or a ceremony like a marriage or something like that. Yeah. So when I was shooting Rubel and his home, you know, all the village came down to see what is going on here. So, but I needed that privacy. 
of my with my characters so yeah. if i put light where light does not exist it creates for extra attention so i had to yeah. thought that no this is not working so i had to go for another kind of light which is infrared light and somehow bhaskar i think it became a style statement yes because if you look at those images this is how people live and this is how like animals the eyes shine in the night and a lot of thing, things happen in the night and adjust to the as, darkness yeah yeah so yeah. the dehumanized state of living as i said i think mm-hmm. comes in that kind of photography uh, so so uh, yeah these are the kind of adoptions adaptations i was constantly going through in the film so you know uh, this is this kind of conversation it has its own generic elements and one of them is a little bit of criticism so i have to bring it up now um, sure <laughs> that's what uh, you know, you, uh, that's what you you that's how, that's how you are defined you are a film critic and, uh, uh, one of our friends pooja rangan has this wonderful book where she sort of points to how there's a dominant trend within documentaries at this point and she talk, speaks globally global documentaries that they partake in a certain kind of humanitarian complex uh where documentaries and documentary filmmakers to crisis prone areas and they make movies about uh, subjects that are underdogs and they need some kind of like saving uh you know so it's a little bit of a savior complex and one can think of many films that have won like even you know oscars i mean they, these films really win the award right and get massively funded too uh so you know there are many aspects of this film where one could argue that you two are participating in this kind of global civil society notion of a humanitarianism a documentary humanitarianism mm. for instance uh you know underdog yes crisis check uh mm. a very very uh, empathetic protagonist very easy on the eyes in rubel mm. uh so i wanted you to say a little bit about that and you know i want to connect this up with the with a question about funding itself right so a lot of the global documentary funding that comes from the global north particularly you know um, netherlands germany france canada but also japan korea singapore which i would place within the global north at this point right and I went to this event in uh, Calcutta called Doc Edge and I believe I first met you there uh, uh through a common friend and in Doc Edge I saw these distributors and funding agencies uh, their representatives and the, the there you pitch your project and they hear you out and they give you feedback and some people come with some rushes maybe 3 minute rushes of what they want intend to do and these people were saying stuff like i don't know if this has enough of a hook for an audience or do you think that particular person is good enough to be carrying the entire documentary on his or her shoulders and that bothered me quite a bit because i thought all these rushes were just spectacular so you know i know i'm putting you in a weird situation because you need to get the funding but if you can speak to this a bit yeah these are these are these are uh, like uh, the tricks of the trade uh, the dockage uh, uh, and uh, what makes india or dockage or kolkata uh, special in the global scenario is that um, almost uh, uh, many countries um, even in asia they have a um, public fund or the public money dedicated to art uh, and where documentaries or non fiction film is also included but not so in india so you do not get any kind of support to create a film like this um, so you have to go to the for the global partnerships mm-hmm. of course where it is uh, a known form of investment production and distribution mm-hmm. television has slots in india none of the televisions have a slot for documentaries which is amazing yeah 
and 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 so you have to have a kind of a global platform to have make a co-production or partnership between different people who are working on this similar or uh, themes uh, it may be environment it, it may be portrait it can be political yes uh, this the the the, uh, the industry exists globally especially in the west and europe uh, of course in the us too so where we have to you know negotiate and somehow find our place and it's not easy mm -hmm. and you have to i knew that yes i have to negotiate with the people that the kind of comments that you mentioned i heard harsher comments from commissioning editors like that and which but you cannot uh, you know take it on that and you have to move on to make that person convinced yes rubel is the best person to convey the film and because i the conviction comes to me because i had my full trust and confidence in rubel for me rubel was not a showpiece but a human a 14 years old kid whose life is can best portray the border because it was he is transiting from let's say the childhood he to 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 adulthood and this is an adolescent boy which can be compared to the both sides of the river he knew how to bribe a border police or a mafia with a bottle of rum at his age i didn't know what is a crime and he knew he was a good student and he wanted to go to school he he wanted to play football in the afternoon instead he was carrying a 25 kilograms of sack of rice on his head with the you know you know wounded shoulder so i could i could talk about rubel very strongly because i knew him it's not as a television shop is just because he looks nice so all this gives you courage and strength to talk about your film in the international forum and demand your share because i we are investing our time our intelligence our creativity to select a subject yeah unfortunately if the government does not understand that because these are the documentations of the realities of contemporary time the past time and the time in future we are talking about so we have to find our support and we have to find if not here from there okay so and i oscar you can you can buy me a camera but i will i know you cannot tell me what i should yeah so you can give me a pen and i decide what i write right. so that would be my balance between right. the giver and the taker i also wonder you know even if i understand that the distribution is limited and the audience is limited i still also wonder how a bengali audience a local audience will look at this film not in terms of that critique of you participating in a global humanitarian complex but it's about local problems with local kinds of you know investments and engagements uh, so that's there too anyway i kind of want to move on to uh, a question about your background and how that informs your and I, there are quite a few questions from our viewers so i we want to get to that very soon so please keep it brief i know i'm from economics you're from geology and we are from the same uh, undergraduate institution presidency college now university in calcutta uh, it's funny i think that an economist failed economist is talking to a failed geologist uh, or maybe we could give it a positive spin but ge generally geology and your interest in this and if you could fold in your next project into this answer i think one or two of our uh, you know batchmates from geology department is participating too i am not sure oh, wow. Uh, and my professor professors in the department would have been very happy to hear this because they were pretty upset when i left the department and joined a film school in the middle of the uh, studies uh, after the graduation uh, well uh, vaskar uh, you know filmmaking is a very rigorous very laborious and a very conscious effort at the same time there is a kind of unconscious or subconscious that plays in your mind and probably studying geology of the earth sciences gave me that perspective to look at the earth 
our planet from a larger temporal perspective. Mm -hmm. And what you see as a static, for example, the Himalayas, it's a huge mountain. If you go there and you look at it, it doesn't move. But for a geologist, it's moving all the time. And it's like in the geological times, we don't talk about hundreds of years or thousands of years. We talk about millions of years. And it's, the, it's like a new baby. Himalaya is like a new baby among the mountains. Uh, so we have, a, uh, as a geology probably gave me a new perspective to look at how I look at River Ganga as a river system, which is takes the glacial melt from the Himalayas, gets becomes dry in the dry season, gets you know, uh, becomes enlivened. It's a live system. The rainwater of North India, and when it reaches Paraka or Murshidabad or Bangla, it, it changes its characters, it's seasonal. So, so I suppose I have that perspective and sometimes the geology could help me understand why is the river behaving like this? You now there are, uh, the river bed is also dependent on the tectonic movements of this area, which over the period tilted towards the east. And so the river water started moving more, flowed more to the east, which is, became East Pakistan when we made the partition. That's how the conflict came with the water. That's why India you know, executed, though it was, it was planned by the British colonials, the India executed. So I understand the need for, the government's need for create Farakka because the how, why the water is going to in, uh, East Pakistan and later Bangladesh. So maybe like that, but no, uh, yes, I, when I go to any place, I just still have, have this habit of looking into stones and rocks and I collect a small stone wherever I go. Great. So a question from Tyler Morgenstern about sound design, and he's very struck mm -hmm. about your use of sound, both to construct bridges between separate scenes as well as to create extremely jarring and shocking transitions like gunshots, trees collapsing into the river and so forth. And while at the visual level, it's often in low light, the sound design is very much high fidelity sound. So if you could speak to that a little bit. Oh, thank you, Tyler. I mean, for asking this question and noticing this because we really, really spent lots and lots of time on time both in here in India and also in Japan because the final post-production and sound mixing was done in Japan uh, and, uh, and the sound designing was done in India. So, uh, and uh, we did make a lot of changes and the film completely transformed after the sound uh, was mixed because the same commissioning editor who watched the picture and he, uh, he was rather reticent and he was become, he remained passive. After watching the mix down sound, he just came and hugged me. He said that now I can do not see a river, but I can feel a river. Hmm. So there is a difference. There is a seeing a river and feeling a river because it's audio visual. And I do take care of the sound and post in the post production. It's not only the sync sound, there's a lot of sounds which are recorded off sync, recorded separately. And sometimes I do use my NG footage, what we call NG footage, not used in the, as visuals, but I do extract sounds from them. So they are not really NGs for me. And we really uh, went, did our folly and everything there to get the real feel of the film. I'm sorry, this is a 5.1 mix, but what you hear is a stereo mix, which never gives this space the spatial fill uh, and the Japanese crew who uh, mixed it down they were supposed to do, do it on uh, stereo but they came and in a very Japanese polite humble way uh, they, they asked, asked for the permission to mix it down for 5.1 I said you don't need 5.1 why are you asking for 5.1 he said after looking at the film we feel that it, it, it is space Wow. It is large canvas. It mm -hmm. is depth. And they asked me to draw a map, an audio map, to bridge the different sequences, which is temporal, 
in terms of audio. So what I, uh, you hear as the transition from an, one sequence to another was drawn horizontally on a map actually, on paper. And of course, you need interruptions and interjections and surprises, which happens in chore. Yes, I, I heard uh, sounds. I had bullets gun passed by my ears. So uh, I, could ex I could transfer those experiences through sound. The next question is from Usha Ayer. She was struck by the focus on women and children, but also the ways in which you focus on non-human characters, uh, the many birds in the film, for instance. I believe the final shot is birds in those little uh, along the bank, right? Or the frog that responds to the human-made sounds uh, and uh, the birds in the nest built into the deltaic mud. Could you speak more about this temporality of the human child and the borderless bird, which produces a different temporality of the planetary, we might say? You kind of already brought it up a little bit with the geology answer. It produces a particularly rich commentary on climate change for human and non-human actors. Yeah, that's thank you, Usha, for, for bringing up that. This is a very important uh, question, and that's that's what uh, really haunts me. That is that if you ask me, I am obsessed with this because I travel a lot with the uh, outside the city. I see the the deep bond between humans and non-humans which is ageless, because what you realize is that nature can live without humans, but humans cannot. So, so it's, it's, it's the way we have become kind of uh, anthropocentric, and we call this Anthropocene. Uh, uh, this is not a geological term, uh, but uh, yes, it can be in other ways. The, the, the balance between humans and non-humans have reached a precarious uh, you know, a situation where we are almost crossing the borders and, and the nature is responding very fast. What could have taken a long geological time, we have done it in the last 200 years. And, and so it is important to look at the frogs, the beetles, the, the, it is important to look at the bees. It is look at the quality of water, whether it is, uh, is it losing the sweetness or is it becoming saline? So all these things are connected. And we, when I was making this film, because they knew the nature, they knew the river by heart. They're the river people. Like a desert man knows the desert by heart. You can get lost, but he cannot. He will, he will have a different sensation from the winds and she will guide you right. Here are the engineers who came from the city and the white collar bureaucrats. They said that this is the right way to manage a river like Ganga. We understand it. We have studied it. We have the satellite images. We have everything. Just, you just sit down and listen to what we are doing there. They, these people said that come next monsoon and this construction will go. And it did go. Because they knew, they, they, they knew how to look at nature. So yes, uh, in this film, I wanted to point it out. The relationship between humans and non-humans is extremely important at a time, this time, when we have become geological catalysts, agents to change yeah. our climate. And it was wonderful, Shorab, to chat with you. And it was we wonderful to be too. a new film in a few years. Thank you, Bhaskar. And keep supporting me. And I could not interact with all of you, but uh, it's lovely to have a New Year's Day, post New Year's Day gathering like this from all over the world. And I know that some of my friends whom I miss physically are here. And it's it's been wonderful. And thank you, Karsiolp Center, and your all my friends there. Thanks.